Michael and Middleton here. And this will be chapter 8 of my allegorical fiction novel, The Great Deep. Uh, again, as I do with all of these, in case this is the first uh, video you're running across, I will hold this up for you to pause and kind of get an overview of the book before I begin. Uh, links will be in the description to where you can find all 20 of my books at the time of this recording, more on the way, as well as uh, find out more about Youth with a Mission Faith Harvest Helpers, uh, the charity that 100% of my proceeds go to, Bumblebee or something. <laughs> so this is uh, chapter 8. Uh, follow the link to my playlist, Good Books, uh, on YouTube, on my YouTube page. To uh, see the other chapters. Chapter 8. William awoke a little earlier than usual the next day. At first he was unaware, unsure that he was awake. He had slept so deeply that he felt almost numb as he opened his eyes. The air was permeated by an unearthly stillness and a faint amber glow painted a stripe on the far wall of his room. William couldn't remember ever sleeping this deeply before, and it kind of scared him. He felt as if he had literally sunk down into the mattress, and must now forcibly unfuse his flesh from the fabric. Suddenly he felt it. As he yawned and began to sit up, an enormous stretch took possession of his body. William was thrown back onto his bed, and he whined in ecstasy. Every muscle and tendon, every bone and sinew seemed to be doing its best to pull him apart into a dozen pieces. Just as he neared the breaking point of physical tolerance, the assault relented. Oh, that feels good, he thought. William was wide awake now. He inhaled deeply, filling every cubic inch of lung capacity, and then letting out the breath in a staccato puff. He sat up, facing the far wall of his room. The amber glow had now faded to a somber shade of orange. Something undefined which had lodged itself in the deep recesses of his mind was being triggered by the radiance before him. A puzzled look covered his face as he cocked his head to one side staring down at the floor. Faint, vague images randomly leapt into and out of his conscious mind. It was like being absolutely certain that you knew someone's name, yet not being able to recall it, like grasping at a reflection. Then, suddenly, he remembered the dreams. Strange dreams, vivid dreams of pure, raw elements. The fire, the water, the piercing, brilliant light. Dreams of stone and flame and torrential rain and incomprehensible beauty. There were memories... Memories of things undefined and unknown to the modern world of man, yet somehow familiar. A terrible chill of revelation pulsated within William. The music, the singing he had heard, or had he, that first day in the cave, he had heard it again in his dreams. There was something ancient about it, something holy. The music, the sound itself, seemed alive. Something about it made William feel small. He squinted his eyes hard and clenched his fists as the flood of sounds and images threatened to overload his mind. He felt as if he were being swallowed up by something larger than himself. Finally, mercifully, the flood of revelation subsided and William returned to the world of plastic, concrete, and aluminum. Some bizarre, obnoxious clatter had shaken him, wrenching him from his otherworldly interlude. He inhaled sharply as the wondrous splendor around him faded to a more familiar surroundings of his room. Turning to his right, he shut off the alarm clock. He then stood and stretched again, choosing to ignore the strange brush with another realm. He turned to gaze out of his bedroom window. The sky was aglow with hues of molten glass. A single brilliant shaft of sunlight stood like a fiery pillar on the far horizon. Obviously, the sun was nearly up. The beam of sunlight reminded William <coughs> of the radiant shaft he'd seen in the field two nights previous. 
He still hadn't gone out to see the blowhole, but was now more determined than ever to do so. William stretched again and then straightened the, cover, the covers on his bed before walking into the bathroom. He removed his pajamas, stuffing them into his laundry bag. He then brushed his teeth and splashed some cold water onto his face. He looked into the mirror above the sink and raked a black comb through his dark wavy hair before returning to his bedroom. A basket full of clean folded laundry sat on the floor at the foot of his bed. He carried the basket to the far side of his room and set it on top of his dresser before selecting a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, and a pair of socks. He had put the rest of the laundry away later. After getting dressed, William grabbed his backpack of cave exploring supplies and started out to the utility room. As he passed through the front room of the house, he heard a thunderous roar coming from upstairs. Goodness, Dad, he thought. You snore like a grizzly bear. He continued on through the dining room and into the kitchen, where he left his backpack sitting on the small table by the window with the blue curtains. Pulling his boots on in the utility room, he grabbed a couple of empty egg crates and started across the back lawn. On his way to the chicken coop, he glanced again in the direction of the blowhole. William noticed that the area immediately around the location of the blowhole, where he had seen the strange light, looked somehow different from the rest of the pasture. Weird, he thought. It's, well, it's greener than the rest of the pasture. And, well, something else. He finally decided that perhaps it looked different because of the big tree next to it, or maybe the shade from the tree kept the ground from drying out as fast as the rest of the pasture, which had full sun most of the day. Or, he thought, of course, the cows like to hang out there. Fertilizer. Something told William that this explanation wasn't quite up to par, but he figured that it would do for the time being. He continued across the backyard to the garden shed at the far end, where he retrieved the day's allotment of chicken feed. He then fed the chickens and collected the eggs. As he exited the coop on his way back to the utility room, he noted numerous strange footprints in the dust around the outside of the coop. Those almost look like hands, he thought. I wonder if those are from raccoons. He decided to ask his grandmother about it later on. He returned to the house and, after storing the eggs, walked into the kitchen to eat a quick breakfast. He opened the refrigerator and, surveying the shelves, selected a leftover slice of apple pie. He poured a glass of milk for himself, retrieved a fork from the silverware drawer, and took a seat at the table by the window. As he began to eat, William could hear the raucous noise of snoring reaching a new crescendo upstairs. He was dumbfounded that he could hear it all the way in the kitchen. Mom must be climbing the walls, he thought. William finished eating, and as he set his plate, fork, and glass in the sink, noticed the coffee pot on the counter. It was still half full from the day before. He pondered this new venture for a moment before retrieving a small saucepan from the cupboard and filling it with the leftover coffee. He placed the pan on the stove and turned it on to medium. He kept a vigil on the dark liquid until it began to steam. He then turned the stove off and pulled a large mug from the back of the counter, filling it to the brim with the reheated coffee. It was quite nearly overflowed, but he stopped it just in time. William had tried coffee once before, but didn't really like it. However, his dad called it wake-up juice. He was beginning to feel a little sleepy again and wanted to be wide awake for his caving expedition. Maybe if I add a little sugar, he thought. He sipped enough coffee from the cup to make enough room for sugar and then spooned in a generous helping. Stirring the sugar in, he took another sip. Mmm, that's better, he commented. He took a seat again, sipping the hot, sweet liquid. Noticing that the snoring upstairs had stopped, he thought, Gee, I hope Mom didn't smother him. <laughs> His grandma's Bible sat at the back of the table with her picture of Seth, William's grandpa, sticking out of one edge. As William continued sipping the coffee, he opened the Bible and studied the photograph. I really miss him, he thought. When he finished emptying the mug, he returned the aged photograph to its place of honor. He then walked over to the sink and placed the empty mug alongside the other dishes, before retrieving his backpack from the table. 
He lifted the heavy bag and strapped it on, preparing to leave. Just as William stepped through the utility room doorway, a voice called out from behind him. Hey, where are you off to, boy? Mary asked. William stumbled, nearly falling, as he spun around while still in forward motion. Oh, hi, Grandma. I'm headed back to the fort today. I thought I'd poke around a little more. Sorry, boy. Not today, Mary replied. William's jaw dropped slightly as the look of confusion spread across his face. Don't you know what today is, she asked. It's, um, William began, it's, he thought hard but could not grasp what his grandmother was getting at. Golly, I hope that the Stuarts aren't coming over again, he thought. At least not if Sherry Pie is with them. It's Sunday, silly boy, Mary interrupted. You'd better take off those old rags and put on some nice church clothes. Your mom and dad will be down for breakfast in a little bit. William was devastated. Not wanting to show the depth of his disappointment, however, he set his backpack down just inside the utility room door and flatly replied, I ate already. He then removed his boots, setting them next to his backpack. Really? Mary inquired. That's too bad. You're going to miss miss out on my biscuits and gravy. William's salivary glands sprung suddenly to life. Well, maybe I could eat one or two or twelve, Mary completed his thought. William grinned. Well, maybe. Still disappointed at having to wait another day for his caving expedition, he glanced back towards his backpack and sighed before returning to his bedroom to change clothes. Pulling the door closed behind him, he paced over to his closet. He removed a pair of black slacks from a cubby hole on the left, tossing them onto his bed. He then slid several hangers to one side, finally selecting a light blue dress shirt with pinstripes. Although he despised them, he knew that his mother would insist on him wearing a tie, so he selected one of his several clip-on ties she had bought for him. He then returned to his bed. Removing his clothes, he tossed them onto the floor by his nightstand. He then changed into the shirt and slacks he'd selected and put on his best pair of black shoes, what he referred to as his dress sneakers. Finally, he clipped on the tie. He walked to the bathroom and retrieved a comb to tuck into his pocket before walking out to the game room. He racked the balls on the pool table and took a dozen or so practice shots before returning to the dining room. His mom and dad were just sitting down as he entered the room. As he took a seat, Mary entered from the kitchen carrying a bottle of Tabasco and a large wicker basket full of biscuits. She set the biscuits and pepper sauce on the table and began to return to the kitchen to retrieve the gravy. Jacob jumped up from his seat, interrupting her. Hey, Mom, let me get that. It's probably a little heavy. Oh, thanks, son, she replied. Just keep your thumbs out of the bowl. Mary took her seat and muttered, never could keep his thumbs out of the gravy, as Jacob strolled towards the kitchen. Several seconds later, Jacob returned, carrying a large country blue bowl of sausage gravy. <clears throat> he carefully set it in the middle of the table next to the biscuits and returned to his chair, licking his right thumb clean as he took a seat. Mary raised an eyebrow and nodded at Teresa, who grinned as she snickered in agreement. William managed to eat two biscuits before offering to help clear the table. Thanks, dear, Mary replied. Just set the dishes in the sink to soak. I'll take care of him this evening. This evening, William asked. Where are we going to church? Denver? He hoped that this wasn't one of those full gospel places where, you know, they give you the full gospel all in one sitting. Teresa replied, No, silly Billy. William cringed. We're going to your grandma's new church in Phoenix and then out to lunch afterwards, and then maybe we'll spend a little time at the mall. Grandma's church in Phoenix? William asked as he turned to Mary. You haven't been driving that old wagon all the way to Phoenix, have you? Well, the Sanders down the road take me in each week, she replied. Real nice folks. They drove me to the doctor in Phoenix whenever I needed to go, too. William turned back to Jacob. Dad, if we're going to the mall, can I bring my egg money? He thought of the BB gun he wanted to buy, but didn't think that he had enough money saved yet. Still, if they were going to the mall, he wanted to have some money on hand. Sure, sport, Jacob replied. You've worked hard for it. You can decide how you'd like to spend it. After a brief revelatory pause, he concluded, within certain limits, of course. 
William finished setting the breakfast dishes in the kitchen sink. He then filled the sink with hot water and squeezed in a little dish soap. Before joining the others in the family car, he returned to his room and re retrieved his egg money, which he had kept in one of the pockets of his Charlie Davis curtains. William yawned loudly as he took his place in the back seat of the car and pulled the door shut. What's the matter, sport? Jacob inquired, still not sleeping well? I don't know how anybody in Arizona could have slept last night, William replied as the car began to move. Teresa interjected, Why's that, honey? William quipped. Dad snored like a dying grizzly. Jacob exploded in laughter, nearly veering off the road. Teresa fell silent, flushing red, her eyes burning holes through the windshield. Mary tried not to grin as, as she muttered, Oh my, under her breath. What? What? William asked. Um, that wasn't me, son, Jacob replied. Huh? Well, who then? William began. Oh no! That's right, boy. It was Mama Bear, Jacob replied. Teresa smacked his leg hard as she chuckled. William was terribly confused now, not knowing how someone so small could snore so big. However, he figured that if he wanted to make it to his 12th birthday, he'd better drop the subject. He sat back and looked out the side window, feigning interest in the scenery. A few moments later, they reached the grand old weeping willow tree where the road intersects with Interstate 17. Jacob slowed the car and turned left, heading south towards Phoenix. About 25 minutes of Sunday morning scenery passed before they exited the highway again, turning right. A few more minutes of travel brought them to a small side street where they turned again and pulled up to a large stucco building with a tall tower of, of sorts in the front, topped by a cross. The building was tan with a large sign to the right of the door, which read, Paradise Valley Community Church. As Jacob entered the parking lot and turned off the engine, Mary turned to William and said, I started to come here a few months ago. I think you're really going to like this church. I miss my old church, William replied flatly. As they all stepped out of the car and began walking, Jacob interjected, I checked this place out when I was down here interviewing at the college. They got a lot of really neat youth activities. I'm sure you're going to like it. It'll be a great place for you to make a bunch of new friends. Yeah, whatever, William thought. You yeah, I can get a decent nap out of it anyway. What's the pastor's name, Teresa asked. Um, I don't know, Jacob began. They were interviewing for a new pastor when I was here. Teresa turned to Mary with the same question in her eyes as they reached the front door. Mary just grinned and walked into the church with the rest of the family following. Several feet inside the door, Mary extended her hand to a tall, lightly bearded man with chestnut hair. Good morning, Reverend, she greeted the man. Why, good morning, Mary, the man replied. Awfully good to see you here. Did your son and his family make the trip out here all right? Jacob stepped up beside Mary as she said, Yes, sir, this here is my baby boy. Jacob stepped up beside Mary and said, Yes, here, this is my baby boy, repeated that. Jacob rolled his eyes slightly as he extended his hand. Good morning, I'm Jacob Thornton, he said. The tall bearded man took Jacob's hand, shaking it vigorously. Glad to meet you. I'm Reverend Jim Jones. Jacob's grip slackened. The pastor leaned in towards Jacob and, through grinning lips, assured him, no relation. Jacob glared at Mary, his face betraying a trace of chagrin. William was really caught off guard by the music playing as they entered the sanctuary. He was expecting some dried up old lady sitting at a dusty piano, and maybe some skinny old guy with his pants hiked up to his chin playing an accordion. But what he saw and heard was something entirely different. The main sanctuary was a huge open room with high ceilings. Towering triangular windows near the top of the wall let in a lot of natural light. They were tinted a light shade of purple, filling the room with a peculiar radiance. At the far end of the room, there was a large, slightly elevated stage. There was no dusty old pan pan piano or toothless old man with an accordion, however. Instead, there was a dark-haired man of perhaps 30 years of age with an electric guitar. To his left stood a slightly shorter woman with a long blonde hair. She was singing and playing an acoustic guitar in front of a microphone. 
To the man's right stood a trumpet player, a woman playing a flute, and a saxophonist. Near the black back of the stage stood a bass guitar, and next to him, a drummer playing a drum setup of perhaps 20 different pieces. William was once again thoroughly confused. This did not look or sound like church as he knew it. The music sounded like jazz, he asked aloud, in a church. He stared blankly at his grandmother. That's right, Mary replied. They also played rock and roll and even a little reggae sometimes. William thought that she must be joking. Until he noticed a set of steel drums standing in the back corner of the stage. He stared blankly at Mary again. They also do hymns sometimes, but probably not like you're used to hearing them, she continued. Ah, come on, boy, just because I'm a grandma doesn't mean I don't like to cut loose and boogie. William dropped his head and slipped into a row of seats next to the back. Jacob, Teresa, and Mary slid in next to him. Pastor Jones figures that there's going to be all kinds of people in heaven, so why not get used to all kinds of music in church now? Mary concluded. There's quite a bit in the Psalms about praising the Lord with stringed instruments and loud clanging cymbals. Sounds like electric guitars and drums to me. To his surprise, William found himself actually enjoying the service. That was until the sermon began. The pastor spoke on bitterness and resentment. William came under the assault of conscience and made the deliberate choice to ignore most of what was said. After the service had concluded, William and his family had lunch at the Big Boy Drive-In down the road from the church. They then drove to a large mall on the outskirts of Phoenix. William went to check out the toy and hobby store as Mary and Teresa browsed the bookstores. Jacob said that he wanted to check out the sporting goods store. <clears throat> Before they dispersed, they all agreed to meet back at the main entrance in three hours' time. William rode the escalator to the second floor and bought an orange Julius at the food court on his way to a large toy store his mother had told him about. There was a no food or drink sign at the entrance to the store, so he had to stand outside window shopping until he had finished his drink. He then threw away the empty cup and began strolling the aisles. Not much caught his fancy, although he found the model rocket kit somewhat interesting. After about 45 minutes, he decided to look around some other stores. He bought a soft pretzel and another orange Julius before taking the escalator back to the first floor. He looked at the guitars in the music store for a while before spotting the sporting goods store at the far end of the mall. Maybe I'll check out the BB guns, he thought, just for fun. William began walking towards the sporting goods store, waving to his mom in the bookstore as he passed. She was just inside the door, flipping through a romance novel called On Winds of Change. He briefly caught sight of his grandmother farther back in the store, looking at the magazine rack. When he arrived at the sport, Sportsman's Paradise store at the far end of the mall, he scanned the numerous aisles. Wow, that's big, he said aloud. Just about 30 feet down one of the aisles, he spotted a store employee restocking a display. Excuse me, can you tell me where the BB guns are, he asked. The man looked at him suspiciously for a moment and then replied, Back left corner. Thanks, William said as he continued down the aisle. He continued on through the aisles, weaving his way around other shoppers until he reached the back of the store. As soon as he turned left, he stumbled upon the object of his quest. <clears throat> wow, there must be 30 different kinds, he thought. He walked along, checking out each different model as he went. Some had adjustable sights, some had real wooden stocks, while others came with stand-up targets he could cut out of the back of the box. 350 FPS. 270 FPS, 575 FPS. William didn't know what FPS meant, but he guessed that the bigger the number, the better it was. How's it going, boy? Mary called out from behind him. <clears throat> oh, hi, Grandma. Okay, I guess, he replied. Just then he spotted a bright yellow sign that read clearance. He scanned down the shelf until he saw an orange tag with the price. Hey, I've almost got enough for that, he thought. Maybe I could borrow a little. Grandma, he began, can I borrow a couple of dollars until we do another egg run? 
Oh, you don't want to spend your money on that, Mary replied. But I really want to get a BB gun, William said. And this one's on clearance. Please, I'll pay you back in a couple of days. Mary leaned in towards William. Let me rephrase that, she said. You don't need to spend your money on that. She winked at him and twitched her head in the direction of Jacob, who was obviously pretending to look at basketballs a few aisles away. Yes, William thought. All right. Thanks, Grandma, he whispered. I think I'll, you know, go look somewhere else. He walked back to the bookstore where he looked around for a while before buying a book on cave exploration. He flipped through it as he sat on the bench near the main entrance, waiting for his parents. That night, William tucked the book into his backpack before changing for bed. After brushing his teeth, he read another chapter of The Beast Within before setting his alarm clock and turning off his light. At first, he was too excited to sleep, both because he now knew that he was getting a BB gun for his birthday and because he was finally going to get the chance to return to the cave and investigate that strange hollow spot that he had discovered. As the night grew dark and cool, however, he was lulled to sleep by the songs of an owl and the distant rumbling of thunder.